Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Jeremiah's J Man Manero, J Man Seminars with Millennial Who Talks, episode number 15 or 16. I'm not exactly sure, <laughs> <laughs> but we're here with Ryan Bocross and we're here with Millennial Who Talks. We're changing lives with real stories from real estate rock stars from across the United States. And I just want to thank Ryan for joining us today. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This will be fun. Look forward to it. And so as you're watching this broadcast, if you see see or hear anything that you like, please just, you can tag a friend, somebody you care about enough to, to you know, share this information with them. Tag them in the comments below, share the, share the broadcast on your local feed, or even if you want to subscribe to our, our broadcast, just type Millenni Who in the comments below. We have a little robot that's going to contact you. So you'll subscribe to just the Millenni Who Talks, nothing else, no other spam whatsoever. We promise. So let's get started. Ryan, why don't you start out with uh, introductions, where you're from, how you got into real estate, and then we'll just take it from there. Oh, man. So uh, I've been in the industry now for about 13 years. I live in Houston, Texas, uh, north side of Houston. We're in the suburbs. But uh, yeah, so 13 years ago, uh, getting into the business uh, was 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 an interesting time. Um, my mother-in-law had passed away, actually, of brain cancer. I was in the restaurant business prior Oh, wow. uh, to real estate. So when she did, uh, she left four kids behind that she had adopted from Russia. And so my wife and I had adopted those four kids. And I was running uh, food and beverage for a country club at the time. And uh, that made it a little difficult to continue that work. Um, it was a lot of hours, crazy time. Uh, so I uh, took, to, took a leave of absence and tried to figure out you know, what my next step was. And a buddy of mine, uh, actually a friend of my wife's, um, took us out for dinner one night and she said, or he said, what are you going to do? <laughs> and so I, uh, hadn't really thought about it yet. Uh, you know, too much was looking into, uh, maybe selling insurance or doing financial planning, something that would provide me a little bit more flexibility with my schedule. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our second. So we literally went from one to six kids in a matter of about three and a half months. Uh, so I needed something that would, uh, would work out a little bit better for us schedule wise. Uh, he said, man, what about the mortgage business? I said, I don't know Jack about it. Uh, but you know, if you're willing to teach me, bring me in and, and all of that, uh, that was the case. So I, I kind of jumped in with both feet and uh, got started in the mortgage business about 2004 and, uh, you know, jumped in, uh, at a, at a decent time. Uh, it was, you know, the first, I guess the first big refi boom of the 2000s. So it wasn't too bad to get in uh, there at that time necessarily. But then, of course, we all know what happened just a few short years after that. You were printing money at that time, right? Yeah, yeah. right, man. We were, nice. we were, we were kicking it. Uh, <laughs> I, I got out of, uh, got out of originating and actually went, uh, became a wholesale account executive for one of the, the big companies uh, that I, I won't name uh, that went away during that time frame. Uh, and so that's kind of what got me out of uh, the mortgage industry. Took a little hiatus and actually uh, did some real estate stuff for an oil and gas company. Uh, during that time, got my real estate license. And uh, when that big project with the oil and gas company was coming to an end, uh, saw the writing on the wall and, and kind of jumped in both feet uh, back into to real estate sales. So uh, that was yeah, 2010, 2011, I guess, sometime around there. So you weathered the storm a little bit, right, at post-bust, post, post bust, I would say? Yeah, yeah, I kind of came out of the crisis uh, with uh, with all of my appendages still attached. <laughs> I mean, what was it like to go from – I mean, I have I have two kids. I, I couldn't imagine going from two – like from one to six – I mean, I guess you go from man to zone yeah. defense, but like, what's that like? I mean, how do you? To be honest with you, man, it was such a whirlwind. Now looking back at it, it's, it's kind of hard to to you know really remember how we made it through uh, those times. I mean, thankfully, my wife and I are still married today. Surprisingly, uh, we made it through all of that. Um, but yeah, you know, trying to 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 do all that, be there for the for the kids, my wife having a new baby, and uh, you know, we still kept having kids. We wanted our own family, even though they were part of the family. We knew eventually they uh, grow up and, and move out and they did. Um, so we just kind of, you know, kept trudging through and just doing what we knew to do. 
Um, you know, there's no book written on how to handle a situation like that. You just kind of get through it, right? I mean, I think my wife and I, when we talk about the hardest times, it's like, how do you get through it? You just, you just do. Yeah, yeah, you just do, man. You just put one foot in front of the other on some ground. That was 2010. Was it an easy transition to go from the mortgage business into real estate? Was was you know what were some of the challenges you faced in your first year there? Yeah, I think you know. You know so I had that uh, I had that kind of transition time where I did the the oil and gas stuff, and so getting back into the the real estate industry, um, you know, it took a little while. I, I I knew the business back and forth. I I engrossed myself in in real estate uh, as a mortgage guy, and so. Um, it was, you know, it was an interesting time uh, to definitely start selling real estate. Um, I had a book of business from, you know, my mortgage thing, uh, but we actually lived in a different part of town. So we built relationships. We got involved in, in the community a little bit here and there and, and some of that. Um, but, you know, at, at first it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a struggle. So honestly, I went after uh, for sell by owners off Craigslist. Uh, and really kind of started working that angle uh, along with, um, you know, trying to work my sphere of influence and uh, and get referrals. We were on the south side of town, uh, kind of in the Clear Lake area um, at that time. And, um, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a slow start, but once I got my feet under me, uh, things started really rolling. And then uh, I got an offer to, uh, to go run uh, agent development and training for uh, REMAX office back up home uh, in, in the part of town that I grew up in and where we live now. And so uh, we took that opportunity and, and kind of moved back to where, uh, where we knew um, everybody. <laughs> right. Where your sphere was. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in taking that position, uh, I still sold. Uh, I told him that was always going to be something that I, I did. I never wanted to uh, completely give up selling uh, just as, especially as a, as a trainer, as a, an educator and you know we changed the remax model a little bit and uh, we created the agent development program specifically for new agents and seasoned agents um, mm -hmm. but we did a lot of recruiting right out of uh, real estate school uh, so we were bringing in a lot of young uh, you know fresh faces into the office and uh, i wanted to make sure that my tools remained sharp and so i continued to sell uh, even though that wasn't you know full time i wasn't uh, doing a whole lot of lead gen or any of that kind of stuff at that time still working my sphere. Um, but it was really good because I could bring in young agents, uh, new agents alongside me, uh, give them the opportunity outside of, you know, the formal classroom uh, training that we were doing and really kind of show them real world, hey, you know, come sit down, let's fill this contract out together. Or, hey, we're going to go uh, meet a buyer, walk a couple houses. Uh, so it really gave me an opportunity to allow some of those new those new folks to, to shadow and get a better grasp of the business right from the get-go. Well, I like what you said when you first started, you know, because so many times we hear stories of people saying like, oh, yeah, you know what? I got into the business and I just shot up and I was an instant success. And it's like, oh, man, come on. What's the real story here? Right. And, and it's we, know like, what we know what statistics say about that. <laughs> right. I mean, least, you know, you're honest in saying like in the beginning it was it was a challenge. It was a struggle. So, you, you know, you went to for sale by owners. You prospected. Like, of course, we all know that referrals. And sphere of influence is the best way to do it. But if you're at the office and your phone's not ringing, and you got six kids at home, you got to do something, right? I mean, yeah. I can't. I'm in the same boat. Like it's, you got to go all in. Right. You got to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I was, you know, um, and I won't say it took that long for for things to really get rolling. Uh, you know, thankfully, business started to come in, and again, I took the position uh, in in and doing the, te uh, the teaching. Uh, and so that helped, that was a salary position. And then of course, bonus off of, uh, you know, production of the office and some of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it, it really uh, gave me an opportunity to pursue uh, with, um, it gave me the opportunity to pursue a passion that I knew I had in me, but I didn't really explore. Uh, and that was the teaching and training side of, of being involved in the industry. Well, I like, and we've had a couple speaker trainers here on, on the show and, and it, I, I love that it's, it's about giving back, 
right? It's it's like you, you've been in the industry and you want to help out others. So somebody watching this that's a new agent, you know, what kind of from your your since you have extensive training experience, what things could they focus on? Like top three things to focus on every day to build their business if they don't have a business or if they're new to an area or they're new to sales in general, because I think not everybody starts in real estate has a sales background. They don't know how to prospect and do all that. Yeah. You know, I, I think if, if you look at um, at real estate sales in general, I think the first thing that a new agent needs to really focus on and, and really concern themselves with is what can I do today to have real estate conversations, right? So, yes, regular conversations with folks is part of building relationships, which is, you know, unless you're an internet lead master uh, and you're running nothing but internet leads, um, having relationships is key. And I think preparing yourself, number one, and setting yourself up to have real is the best place that an agent can get started. Um, so, you know, a lot of training programs really focus on contracts and, you know, a lot of different things that to me come later down the road. Uh, for a new agent. So I think preparing yourself to have real estate conversations, which that means doing your research, understand what's going on in the market around you so that when you get into those conversations, you're coming from a place of authority. Uh, you're actually speaking with some sort of knowledge and not just using general facts and figures. Uh, you're, you're actually to the market. Um, so I guess that would be number two is, is make sure that you understand the market around you that you're wanting to work in so that when you have those real estate conversations and those opportunities come up, you don't look like a moron um, <laughs> by, you know, rattling off, you know, things that anybody can find out by logging into Zillow or, you know, any of the other sites. Uh, so those would be the two, I guess. And the third thing would be is um, to get organized from the very beginning. Understand that you're starting a business. You're a startup. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, as you're having these real estate conversations, you need to have a place to put those. You need to remain organized so that you know, hey, on December 24th, whatever, Christmas Eve, uh, I was at a networking event or whatever it was. I was at a Christmas party uh, and so-and-so asked me about the market, right? So I'm in Houston. What's going on with all these houses that were flooded, right? Log that conversation somewhere so that you have an opportunity to follow up and you remember what you talked about initially. So. Uh, first thing is to is to put yourself in a position to have real estate conversations. Uh, the second thing would be to do your research and understand your market so that those real estate conversations are productive. And then the third thing is uh, treat your business as a business uh, and, be, and get organized uh, and put your people into uh, a CRM or somewhere that you can go back and refer to those conversations. Those would be my top three things. Is there anything anyone specific that you would suggest as far as helping them to get organized and write those notes? Obviously it depends on if they're tech savvy, some, you know, swear by a journal that they write in every day and others go to Evernote or something like that. Like, you know, what, what do you recommend? What, what kind of system if they're getting started? Yeah. You know, I mean, it really depends on, um, you know, what kind of tools are provided uh, by your brokerage, right? So if you're with a, a company that provides you a CRM or some sort of database management tool, uh, use that, learn that, um, and, and dig deep into that. If, if not, there's plenty of options out there, right? I mean, like you said, Evernote is a great opportunity uh, to, to organize yourself. You can do more than just log uh, conversations in there. You can keep all kinds of notes, man. I, I, I ran my sales business on Evernote for a long time. Um, it, you know, I put all my showing notes in there. I'd share those those notebooks with my buyers uh, and we'd run everything through Evernote, obviously with the exception of you know, electronic signatures and the actual transaction. But um, yeah, there's plenty of great CRMs. I mean, we can sit here for 25 minutes and rattle off, you know, how many good CRMs there are. Um, but, you know, again, the, the, the old saying is the best CRM out there is the one that you're actually going to use. So play around with it, man. There's so many of them that offer, uh, a, a free trial at the beginning. Um, ask folks in your office what they're using. If, again, if you don't have a tool that uh, that your your brokerage provides you, um, 
but you know, yeah, getting organized from the very beginning is key. I just, I, I just can't stress that enough. I think you've got to know who your people are, what conversations you're having with them and how often you're touching them. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll testify to that. When I first started, I was so big into the prospecting and going after sales that there would be times that I was supposed to call somebody back and I'm just like, I don't know who I was supposed to call back. Next thing you know, I see the listing come up. Like, oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, that was the right? person I was supposed to call yeah. back. Yeah. They posted on their Facebook, hey, we just signed a contract to buy a new house today. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, those lessons are learned one way or another. You, you, you pay for that education, as they say. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit since you're – Houston, Texas uh, recently had, you know, devastation a little bit by hurricane. Was it Maria as well or Harvey? Harvey. Okay. It's all these freaking hurricanes. I can't remember their names. Right. <laughs> so hurricane Harvey hits Houston. You're the, their tele experience and, and, you know, what was that like? And, and what did you do to get involved? Man, that was uh yeah, it was a crazy time. I, I think I still have some PTSD and, and not to downplay those who really suffer from PTSD. Uh, but, you know, that experience, man, I was I think I was able to sympathize with with our men and women to come back from war and experience PTSD uh, because the after effects mm -hmm. of that were were crazy. So, uh, you know, the storm rolled in through, uh, through the weekend. And, um, you know, everybody's posting stuff. It's you know all over social media. The rains come in. Water so rides here. Uh, you know, he sent me a text and he said, "Hey, uh, you know, we can we can give thoughts and prayers all we want, but at some point we've got to get some shit done, right?" Uh, and so Amen. we we went back and forth and started texting, and uh, we loaded up the boats and we went to a, a part of town not too far from where we all lived that we knew was taken on water. Uh, we put the boat in and, and went and started pulling people out of an apartment complex. And it just, uh, it, it grew from there, honestly. So we set up shop uh, in a church um, as kind of our, our headquarters or home base. Uh, and through the course of the next probably 10 days, uh, we dispatched anywhere between 1,000 and 1,200 vessels and probably about 3,500 men and women to go out and do uh, water rescues across uh, across the city of Houston. So. You know, man, uh, some of the you know, six or seven year old girl's arms wrapped around my neck, you know, as I'm carrying her out of the house and, and putting her into the boat, a, a teenage girl who, you know, is old enough to kind of understand the severity of what's going on, but maybe not mature enough to truly understand everything that, you know, is really happening and what the after effects of something like this is going to be. Um, you know, I mean, it was it was nuts. We're you know wading through water where there's oil slicks, and you can smell the gasoline because the, uh, the submerged cars are are leaking fluids, right? Um, so, <clears throat> you know, yeah, that lasted about about ten days, um, and and that was that was brutal, man. I was uh, I was exhausted. I, I after those ten days, I was literally down for about four or five after that because I. Uh, the, the doctor said I had some environmental toxicity or something because of all the crap that was in the water, I guess. Uh, but after kind of all of that, um, you know, search and rescue part came up, then was kind of the recovery part. Uh, and so, you know, I wasn't shy about sharing some things on social media. Uh, during the time that I was out uh, doing water rescues, my, my wife uh, was in touch with shelters. We were dry. So just to say that our house was, was high and dry. Thankfully we didn't experience any, um, flooding or water. Uh, but my wife was in touch with uh, a number of the shelters that were super local to us and were given her specific lists of items. So she set up an Amazon wish list and man, the outpouring of people specifically in the real estate industry, uh, that checked off items from those lists just over and over and over again. We have boxes in our house. I mean, our garage just became this, uh, you know, hub of all of these shipments that came in from everywhere. Um, it was just amazing to watch the real estate industry come together. Yes, locally in Houston, a ton of people just really put themselves out there. Uh, but across the country, man, the, the real estate industry as a whole just really um, – you know, it, it really impressed me to see those folks 
uh, put their monies where their mouth is, you know, and, and what we, can we do to help? Well, here, like you can actually do this. Uh, and so then my wife and I also set up a website um, that was uh, set up so that folks who needed help could get adopted. Uh, and so we had folks from, again, all over the country, we had brokerages adopting families uh, and sending them gift cards, uh, items that had specific needs and some of those things. So, um, you know, it was totally cool to watch uh, the, the real estate industry, um, just just gather around uh, the, the folks of Houston and, and make good stuff happen. Uh, I, you know, I, it helps with the recovery in a, in a huge way, I think. Well, and I think, it, you know, in times of crisis, to really see how the real estate industry steps up. You know, it's not like, like you said, hopes and prayers and, and all that's great, but we got to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And just the the millions of dollars, I think, that went into the Realtor Relief Fund in the in the months after all of the hurricanes that happened, all the areas that were devastated, I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it really just, was. It really it, was. Like you said, put their money where their mouth was, but it's not just money because if somebody could volunteer, I know, you know, there's people from from Rochester, New York, which is pretty far from Houston, Texas. We had trucks yeah. go down from Rochester, New York to, to, to help out with the relief effort. So I know it's yeah. not just money, no, I mean, it's time, it's yeah. people, it's labor. Keller it's Williams, you know, Keller Williams have their, they have their family reunion in Austin every year, right? Well, it was shortly after all of this went on. And, and man, they, they basically shut down family reunion, put everybody in buses and, sh and, and bus them to Houston. Uh, and so we had thousands of Keller Williams agents just scattered across the city of Houston doing stuff. That they, I mean, they were in mucking out houses. I mean, that's... You know, and, and that's one thing that I just the real estate industry as a whole. Yeah, man, they stepped up and, and you know, props to my friends uh, that work at Keller Williams and everything that those guys did. And of course, other brokerages. That's just a specific story just because I know a bunch of them, you know, mm -hmm. showed up in Austin and, and booked all of their travel, planning on going to a conference and doing all of those things. Uh, and they gave all of that up to hop on buses and, and come into Houston and walk into these houses that have been flooded and, muck them out and, and work at distribution centers and all that stuff. So yeah, it's just super impressive to see uh, the folks from the industry come together uh, and, and really help out in, in a time of need. Um, obviously nothing like that's ever been seen before, right? I mean, you and I were talking Puerto Rico is another uh, situation that's just dire, um, you know, but to, to watch folks come together uh, for a common cause like that and to really do good and not just, um, They're on the ground, man. They're cutting out sheetrock and, and scraping up, hard, you know, flooring and stuff. It was it was amazing to watch. Yeah, and it, I I feel like it it deserves to be said and mentioned, and even people that that aren't in real estate that are watching this because I think sometimes we're stigmatized as like, okay, we're just salespeople, but I mean, we're an industry full of people that care. They care about yeah. not just selling houses. They care about the people, the the families, everybody who's affected. You know, it's. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, it was it was said a number of times during all of that, you know, I mean, you know, as real estate industry professionals, um, you know, reputation's not the greatest, right? I mean, that of a used car salesman. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times during all of that, even my wife said it, just, you know, my my faith in the industry and my faith in, in the people of the real estate industry had been restored by everything that, that I did. Uh, to come together and, you know, make good stuff happen during that period of time. So it was awesome. Well, we salute you and no. your wife <laughs> and everybody else. Well, for stepping up, you know, because you, well, you, had, you had the opportunity to just cuddle up in a blanket and say, you know, say, okay, I hope everybody's okay. But you actually stepped up and, and, and made some stuff happen. So we salute you for That's that. True. Well, I appreciate that. Just Just one of many, though. Just one of many, for sure. So let's let's get into leadership now a little bit. You know, you're you're involved in leadership and uh you know, how has that helped shape your career in the you know? Yeah, you know, how, I think getting get getting involved, involved getting involved in uh industry volunteerism, I guess. Um right. I was pushed into it uh by <laughs> Vicky Vicky, yeah, Vicky Fullerton who uh, was 2017 uh, Texas Association of Realtors um, chair. 
And she's been somebody who I've known since I was in the mortgage industry. And, uh, you know, she pushed me into getting involved in the local level uh, with YPN and, uh, and, and doing some different things uh, with the technology committee and all that kind of stuff at, uh, at HAR in Houston. And um, once I really got into that, I, I, I saw a different side of the industry, really. Um, yes, there's a lot of politics to play into it and, and some of those things. But what I saw was an opportunity um, to really kind of have my voice heard um, and the voice of those who maybe didn't want to commit the time or the energy or um, whatever it may be to, to actually get involved and sit on committees. So I think that was that was one of the things that really drew me into, uh, you know, yes, I, I want to be involved. Uh, YPN was the was the biggest kicker. Uh, for me in, in that, um, you know, I, we, we, we've seen the average age of a realtor uh, come down. Uh, more young folks are getting uh, involved in the in the industry and, and choosing this as a career. Uh, but then we're also seeing a lot of them uh, get involved. And I think YPN has obviously been kind of that entree into leadership for a lot mm -hmm. of folks. And uh, as I started seeing that in what we were doing at a local level, um, I, I wanted to be more involved. I, I wanted to play a bigger part in kind of that uh, next generation of the industry coming in. Um, and so I, I started doing more with YPN, uh, invited to speak at you know, YPN events across the country, got involved on the national level uh, on the advisory board and uh, sat on that advisory board for three years and really just loved um, being a part of the community that is uh, folks who give of themselves for the better sake of the industry. Uh, and that's outside of YPN as well, right? I mean, anybody who is serving in any sort of uh, committee or uh, advisory board, um, leadership position, you're, you're giving of yourself for the better of the community and for the better of the industry. Um, so I think that for those who have a strong opinion uh, in certain <laughs> things, and there's a lot of us to do, right? I mean, that was, I think that was one of the things that really drew me into it was folks saw that I had a strong opinion uh, about certain things and about the direction of the industry um, and, and how, and, and, and this isn't to disrespect um, those who came before us that are younger, um, but you know, there, there's certain things through the course of, of time that change. Um, and, and those, we'll just say legacy agents who had certain successes um, held on to a lot of that for a long time. Now, you, you know, you've got folks that, that will change with the times and will adopt technology and adopt different ways of doing business. Um, but I think we started to see that the shift uh, to a, a younger realtor started to take place very quickly uh, and maybe quicker than a lot of folks uh, in leadership roles expected. Uh, and so I think it was uh, at that point that I saw a lot of that change starting to take place that I knew that I needed to be a part of um, again, not just making my voice heard, but the voice of this, this younger generation, this next generation of uh, the industry be heard. So I, I, I got involved. Um, from that, you know, I've, I've sat on a number of, of uh, committees and boards locally. Um, next year or, or this year, we're 2018 now already. Um, <laughs> I am I'm the, uh, the vice chair of the MLS and Technology Committee for uh, Texas Association of Realtors. And then um, this year, I am vice chair for um, the NAR Residential Economic Trends and Issues Forum uh, for NAR. So, through all of that, what I've what I've seen is just an opportunity um, to give back to the industry. Um, you know, those of us who have had any sort of success uh, understand that there's folks that are are doing all of that before us. They have, have put all of this together uh, to enable us to be able to come in and enjoy this career and to enjoy the industry. And so I think that it's, you know, not everybody's going to do it. Obviously, it's a small percentage that, uh, that choose to volunteer. But what leadership has shown me is, um, is that I, I do have a voice and there are people willing to listen. And so I think there's a misconception that um, those who, who might not choose, those who choose to not get involved um, might feel as though their, their voice isn't important enough to be heard uh, until they get involved. And then they realize, hey, I've got good ideas. This might actually go somewhere. 
so I think that's one of the key things uh, that I've learned and then I want to encourage others, especially folks that are already involved in YPN. Don't just limit yourself to YPN. Uh, if you're, if you love technology, then get involved in the technology committee uh, or advisory boards or, or some of that. If you're, if you love geeking out on data and, and understanding the MLS, right, then get involved in your MLS committee. Um, some folks will say, you know, oh, it's, it's a good old boy network and it's hard to get in. Um, just keep, you know, and to that, I just say, keep trying because keep there's a certain point where um, your your voice, you know, will will be heard uh, and there will be an opportunity for you to help shape the future of the industry. Again, those folks that are that, that have done it for years helped shape the industry for us. Um, and if there's certain things about the way that they've shaped the industry that you don't like uh, or that you feel could be done different or more efficient, um, then, then, then get in, make your voice heard. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of my encouragement. I could talk about leadership uh, for, for a long time. There, there's, some, there's some really good folks around the country that I've had the opportunity to meet because of leadership, and I've built my referral network. Um, you know, you could say, I need an agent in, you know, XYZ city, and it, it's likely that I'll be able to name somebody because I've chosen to get involved and, and build a network of folks. And help shape the industry as those guys have too. So, um, yeah, it, I think it's a super important um, responsibility as, as well. So, if, if like that, if you're if you're thinking about it, you know, hit me up again. I can talk about it for a while. <laughs> well, I, I like what you said about if you have a strong opinion, right? Because like when I first started, I had a, a a managing broker at the time, I go to him and I go, you know what, this, uh, and he'd go, well, why don't you do something about it? And I'd look at him and, yeah, why don't I? And that's what, like, it was yeah. kind of how I, I got involved with, like, if you have a strong opinion about something, or you feel that something could be done better or differently or more efficiently, get involved, do something about it. And there's no guarantee that it's going to happen overnight. Well, nothing's going to happen you're overnight. Involved, <laughs> Right, nothing's gonna happen overnight. And thumb for them to listen. You got to keep plugging along. But like you said, eventually, you know, your your voice will be heard. It, but step one is to get involved. And if it's just, you know, at, at your local level, and then from your local level to the state, state to national. And then if you're watching this right now, you're a new agent, younger agent, and, and reach out to anybody that you've that you've met through these. Millennial who at PN start one. Okay, and and we can get you information on how to do that, or or find one that's close to you, and just collaborate with your the other YPNers in your area because everybody's willing to help one another. I mean, that's that's, that's what a, I love about that's it. you know, and that's a great point. And and even aside from YPN, you know, I, one of the misconceptions that I learned through all of this is that those you know, those folks that sit in leadership right are like up in the ivory tower and and not accessible and won't listen to you and won't collaborate and won't have conversations. And I've, I've found that to be completely the opposite. Um, you know, it takes effort to build those relationships, right? Part of building those relationships is, is what helps lead you through um, those different channels to get involved. Um, and, and once you're willing to step out uh, and meet those folks and share your thoughts, um, that's when things really start to happen. Because again, you might say something that nobody has said before. I mean, while a lot of us may be thinking the same thing, it takes that one person who's brave enough to speak it out. And, and that's a lot, in a lot of cases, that's what is needed to get the ball rolling. Right. So, um, those folks are super accessible and especially in YPN, like you said, man, any of us are willing to share, uh, and, and collaborate and help. And there's so many resources that NAR has put together over the years, uh, to help folks get a, a network started and, and some of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, don't don't be shy. Uh, you know that's the biggest thing is don't be shy. Reach out. Well, <laughs> want to stick to the roughly thirty minutes here. That in in closing, if you were talking to the young Ryan, just getting into the real estate industry, or just a new agent in general, you know, with all the experience, all the training you have now, what kind of advice would you give that you haven't already given us? You know, through this interview so far, uh, just closing words like, do this. Yeah, I, I would, um, you know, I, I would, I guess you could wrap up so much of what I said uh, uh, into, um, but seek, 
and here's the, you know, the trainer and the educator part of me coming out. Um, seek that knowledge. Um, always have a learning mindset. Um, and, and, and don't ever be afraid to ask a question. Um, there's really, there's no dumb questions, right? Uh, dumb question is the, the only time a question is dumb is if you've asked it 10 times, right? Uh, so there's just not, there's, there's so much to learn and things change so quickly um, that you've got to have a, you've got to have a learning mindset. So um, always seek knowledge, uh, always be willing to listen to somebody who's gone before you uh, as you know, the industry changes, there's still going to be things that are fundamental to success. Uh, and somebody who's been in the industry for 25 or 30 years definitely has something of value to share with you. Uh, and in most cases, they will be willing to share. So, um, so, so don't, um, don't shut yourself in, you know, to a, a four walls with your computer and think that you can get it all right here. There's a lot of knowledge that can be attained by, uh, by using and leveraging social media and electronic means, but um, grab that agent in your office that's been in the business for 25 or 30 years and, and, and take them out to lunch. Um, take them out for a cup of coffee and, and pick their brain. Uh, but, you know, yeah, it goes back to just, just always have a learning mindset uh, and be seeking knowledge for sure. Well, on that note, Ryan, thank you so much for your time and all that you do. We salute you to keep Thanks, on man. keeping on. Uh, and again, if you're watching this, you want to subscribe to the broadcast, just type Millenni Who in the comments. We'll be sure to subscribe you. But for now, don't be good, be great. We'll see you on the next show.